so, um, so yes, I'll be speaking about the impact of mental health issues on couple relationships. Um, just say a little bit about me. Um, as Emily mentioned, I'm a social worker and I've been working in the last 20 years uh, in, in psychiatric settings and in hospitals. So I worked at the Jewish General for 12 years and then I moved to the Lakeshore General where I currently am. And I also have a private practice um, in the West Island. Um, so uh, just a few comments. Um, during the presentation, I may use terms like partner or spouse interchangeably. Uh, later on, when I discuss specific disorders, uh, there's no way meant to imply that all people of one with one diagnosis have the same issues. Um, obviously, there's a lot of variance within diagnoses. Um, diagnosis is a general set of symptoms that can occur in varying degrees for different uh, individuals. Um, same thing goes for personality disorders. There tends to be a lot of stigmatization with personality disorders, and I, I really um, want to emphasize the same thing, <laughs> that uh, people with personality issues and traits have um, uh, different presentations and different traits that uh, may occur. Um, in fact, all of us have personality traits that can be problematic in the context, context of couple relationships. So um, psychiatry is uh, far from being a perfect science. I'm also going to talk about not specific treatments, but in general. Uh, so treatments that work for one individual may not work for another. So when I'm talking about treatment, I may say, you know, that if the person is treated, the outcome will be better, which is generally true. However, not all treatments work for all people, and some people are just chronically refractory in their treatment, which poses its own set of issues. Um, so the degree of symptom management will, will vary from person to person. Um, so I'll start with the, the basis of couple relationships. Uh, really, it's um, attachment theory is the basis of uh, human connection. It was uh, originated, the theory was originated by John Bowlby in the 1970s. Um, attachment is a primary human need. All humans strive for a secure connection, uh, secure and emotional connection with everyone around, th those around them, particularly um, the people they're closest to. So <coughs> attachment begins in infancy and we carry the attachment experience into our adult relationships. Um, we seek and maintain contact with significant others. It's one of our innate needs. Um, from infancy to adulthood, we experience our early attachment figures, usually the mother. Um, our experience with our mother is usually what influences our future relationships in our choice of romantic partners. <clears throat> I'm a terrible public speaker. <laughs> so, just bear with me. <laughs> I'll settle down soon. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, just in general, uh, the more secure the attachment, the greater likelihood of relationship happiness and stability in the long term. Um, security, um, secure dependence complements autonomy. In Western culture, dependency is pathologized. Um, you know, Western culture often promotes uh, the concept of self-sufficiency and independence and self-reliance as the thing that everyone should strive for. When in fact, uh, secure relationships and secure attachment is what um, people should try to strive for. In attachment theory, there's no such thing as a complete independence uh, from others or over-dependency, but rather effective versus ineffective dependency. Oops. Sorry. Okay, so in times of stress or sickness, the significant other becomes our refuge and support in many ways to help us weather the storm. If we can't count on our significant other in times of stress, the likelihood of illness uh, increases. Um, attachment offers a safe haven while the absence of it results in distress. Uh, proximity to a loved one tranquilizes the nervous system. Our ability to connect with other people is an inbuilt emotional regulation device. So our attachment to significant others is our primary protection against helpness and helplessness and distress. Just some of the theory I'll <laughs> go over very quickly. Um, yes, but emotionally, like, well, it could be prime, uh, proximity, but even if you're very far away, if you know that somebody, that your loved one has your back, regardless of where you are, that's really, it's more the emotional uh, proximity that I'm referring to. To always know that, they, that you have 
somebody there, and you're not just sort of out there in the void on your own. Okay, so attachment theory informs our internal models and the way we perceive others. So it also influences our behavior and communication patterns uh, in our relation to other people. There are four main attachment styles. Um, individuals with a secure attachment generally feel worthy of love and, and care. They are generally confident and they're attuned to emotions. They can trust fairly easily and can communicate when they're upset quite directly. Um, in individuals with an attachment, an anxious attachment style, they generally have much more emotional sensitivity. So uh, generally they have a sensitive nervous system, um, uh, just more anxious person in general. Uh, they struggle to communicate their needs directly and they tend to act out when they're triggered, um, out of fear usually. So they may get angry very quickly in an attempt to pull people back in. Individuals with avoidant dismissive attachment styles have poor tolerance for closeness. Um, they often downplay the importance of relationships and are usually quite self-reliant. So in a relationship, those are the type of people that may appear very rejecting or cold or harsh. And it's to kind of keep a distance from their loved ones a lot of the time. Uh, people with disorganized um, or avoidant fearful attachments tend to be uh, more dependent in relationships than, than the avoidant dismissive type of person. Um, they often have strong fears of rejection, uh, lower self-esteem, and high anxiety in relationships. So all people generally have characteristics belonging to one of these four attachment styles. Uh, frequently in couples, distress occurs when the partners with different attachment styles fail to connect. So for example, in a client with an anxious attachment style who is married to a partner with an avoidant attachment style, um, attachment needs and connection may be very difficult to attain. Uh, as a partner with an anxious attachment seeks out the support of her dismissive partner, uh, he or she may be met with an inability uh, to tolerate the emotion or the closeness on behalf of their partner. Um, the distress level is very likely to increase along with an escalation in demands for closeness and connection. When the demands aren't met, um, often the anxious person will escalate in anger. That, that's often what will happen. And when that doesn't prompt a response, depression is usually what occurs after that. Sort of a common theme in depression in women. Uh, I mean, there are many causes of depression, but in when it's really relationally based, oftentimes it has to do with the, the marital relationship or the, the love relationship. This ha there's a difficulty with the connection and the, the need is not being met in terms of uh, connecting. And Well, we can talk about that after maybe. Um, uh, okay. In all uh, couple relationships, Partners have a variety of attachment styles that interact and can sometimes cause conflict and tension. When mental illness presents in a couple, the already strained uh, coping mechanisms may be further exacerbated when partners are unable to connect and soothe each other due to ineffective attempts at connection. Okay. So in general, uh, partners of mentally ill spouses uh, report higher rates of psychological distress uh, higher rates of anxiety, depression, uh, overall lower subjective well-being. Uh, there's often um, feelings of guilt uh, or grief as well. Depending on the illness and symptoms in the partner, grief for the loss of the partner and relationship is common. Uh, for example, in, in a couple where one partner develops a severe psychosis or a severe psychotic disorder, it's not uncommon for spouses to describe their partners in, as unrecognizable. Um, I was following a couple where the, the, the gentleman became ill. And this is a couple that had been together since they were 14. And the wife, you know, and, and he had a, a very late onset psychosis. And she said, I just, I don't even know who this man is. <laughs> it's like he, I've, I've known him my entire life. And yet it's like a stranger has come into our house. And I, you know, I can't, I, I can't connect with him. I don't know what to do anymore with him. Um, everything I say is, taken the wrong way and we've always had this really great relationship so it becomes very very stressful uh, so in um, the partner in situations like that the partner may want to distance themselves and may have thoughts of separation or divorce which uh, can also result in feelings of guilt um, especially in you know thinking well now that he's sick how can I leave him 
Um, yes. Um, so a psychotic disorders, there's a wide range of psychotic disorders, like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder. Um, and basically they entail symptoms where there is a distortion of perceptions um, and thoughts. So for example, a primary symptom would be paranoia. Uh, people who uh, become hypervigilant, believe that other people are out to harm them, uh, or they may be hearing voices telling them to act or not to act, or just, you know, derogatory voices, or um, it, it depends. Yeah, does that answer the question? Okay. Um, where was I? Okay, so other uh, social, physical, and financial stressors include, um, oh, there's a spelling mistake, reduced social activities, reduced family activities, financial difficulties, and sexual difficulties. Um, Uh, for example, a depressed spouse may not be able to engage socially. They may not be able to activate themselves or have the desire or energy to do anything socially anymore. For someone who develops a psychotic disorder, uh, they may act differently uh, or be perceived differently. They may be very paranoid and never want to leave the house um, out of fear uh, or untreated symptoms. Um, some people don't want to go out for fear of stigma. Like if everybody knows what happened to me or what happened to my husband, you know, what will they say? Um, a reduction in family activities can also result, again, because a reduced capacity of a reduced capacity to engage uh, with family members. At times, extended family of the well spouse may exert pressure also to leave the ill partner. Um, so visits can be reduced, to, uh, you know, can be limited to reduce conflict and to reduce pressure on the spouse. Um, but it also ends up limiting the amount of support that spouse can receive. So. Uh, job loss or reduction in work hours due to illness can also result in severe financial strain. Um, this can be sustained if the ill partner becomes too impaired to return to work as well, which is unfortunately a reality um, in certain situations. So um, sexual difficulties can also be problematic. Uh, when a partner becomes ill, it isn't uncommon for their spouses to find them unrecognizable, as I mentioned before. Um, or symptoms of certain illnesses may cause a deterioration in personal hygiene, uh, making the partner less desirable to their um, spouse. Similarly, for the ill spouse, um, their illness may make them less interested in engaging in sexual relations. Also, medication can play a very strong role in reducing libido and causing sexual dysfunction. And I, I have to say that that, I think, is, is one of the major things I often hear about because it's, you know, it's one thing to stabilize um, illnesses, the, the medication that is very important, but that's one area that we don't really have a good solution for a lot of the time to, um, to uh, improve sexual, well, on sexual difficulties. So, so in a lifetime, um, many different events or situations can influence couple and family life and cause stress, good and bad. Um, the Holmes Ray Stress Inventory Scale uh, was uh, developed by two psychiatrists in 1967, uh, Thomas Holmes and Richard Ray. Um, their premise was that stressful life events could result in illness for those who experience them. And basically, they attributed a score to various life events they calculated to determine the likelihood that their subjects would become ill. The higher the score, the more likely uh, the level of illness. So, I just put this in to kind of indicate for, for example, for the spouses um, and for the, the sufferers of a mental illness, the various stresses that can be, that can present. Um, so as an example, let's see if I can do this. Number six, major personal mm, <laughs> injury or illness. Um, and number 11, uh, if you add them up, this score is uh, at a 97, which is considered a low to moderate risk. But in mental illness, usually it doesn't occur in a vacuum, and many other stressors, as described previously, uh, accompany it. So uh, when you factor in work, financial, yeah. Sure. Um, this is also, th this list is a lot longer. I just didn't have room on the slide, so I just, <laughs> there are, I think, maybe 100 different uh, items on that. 
scale. Uh, but if you were to factor in for like many of the couples I see or families that I see where all the stressors are involved, um, it, it could add up easily to uh, over 300, which, which makes the uh, risk factor for illness high to very high. Well, yeah, yeah, any type of illness, but you know, I, health, illness well, stress is also, well, yes, yeah, so any life stressors can cause mental health issues. I, I put this in sort of as, um, because we were talking about spouses of mental, uh, with people who have mental illness, so the spouses with under a lot of stress, you know, which generally accompanies uh, diagnosis of mental illness, then there, there's a very high likelihood that they could become ill as well. Um, okay. So, so I'm just going to do a very brief introduction to common mental health uh, issues that impact relationships. Uh, again, the in impacts will vary depending on um, the person, the family, the couple, the illness. Um, it's based on the DSM-5. So in the Access one is mental health uh, and substance use disorders. Um, and access two, similarly, but it's mainly just reserved for personality disorders and intellectual impairment. Um, so access one is like I mentioned earlier, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders. While uh, personality disorders in the access two uh, include uh, cluster A, B, and C disorders like um, schizoid, uh, borderline, narcissistic, obsessive, compulsive. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I'll be focusing on a few disorders from axis one and two. Um, axis three, four, and five are beyond the scope of, of this talk. Um, so before I begin uh, with an overview of a few common disorders and some of the couple treatments and goals associ associated with each, it's important to note that serious mental illness, uh, substance abuse, or dual diagnosis um, may need individual treatment and stabilization before any kind of family or couple um, issues can be addressed. I can't stress that enough, actually. If couple therapy is attempted without stabilizing major symptoms of the illness, it's unlikely to work. Um, or, uh, and then it would lead to a lot of discouragement, probably more than anything else. Uh, people need to be ready and able to process information and to work together. So, is this okay so far? Am I talking too fast? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so, I thought I would uh, speak about bipolar disorder first. Um, so bipolar disorder, also previously known as manic depression, is a mental disorder that causes unusual shifts in mood, energy, activity levels, concentration, and the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks. Um, if you look at the various symptoms, uh, where do we go? <laughs> um, people having a manic episode, uh, you know, usually bipolar disorder is um, either people go into mania or have depression or a mix of both. Um, so some of the symptoms um, can include uh, feeling uh, very uh, high, elated, irritable or touchy, feeling jumpy, wired. Um, people generally have a decreased need for sleep in manic episodes. They talk very fast about many things. Um, their thoughts are often racing. Um, they are some, sometimes present with very risky behaviors uh, and uh, impulsivity. Um, at times also eating and drinking excessively, spending a lot of money, um, having reckless sex. Uh, at times there's a lot of grandiosity that comes in a manic episode. Um, people having a depressive episode, on the other hand, will, may feel very down, empty, worried or hopeless, um, may have trouble falling asleep or be sleeping all the time, uh, increased appetite, weight gain, um, Uh, having trouble concentrating, there's a lot of cognitive impairment that often comes with depression. Um, and um, people often say they have very little interest in almost all of their activities. Um, decreased or absent sex drive and an inability to experience uh, any pleasure. Uh, feelings of 
hopelessness, worthlessness, um, thinking about death and suicide, and attempts are not unusual. Um, and in particular, all depressions are very serious, but in particular bipolar depressions, for example, tend to be very, very, take a long time to treat, and they can be very profound. So um, I thought I'd uh, maybe have a case example <laughs> just to illustrate some of the issues that can happen in a, um, a manic episode in a, somebody who has a bipolar disorder. So um, <clears throat> I'll talk about a couple uh, who I re I'll refer to as Bill and Sue. <laughs> They've been married for several years. Um, Bill has had a couple of manif ep manic episodes over the course of the marriage, but his most recent one nearly broke the couple. Um, during the episode, after stopping his medication, he became increasingly um, manic over the course of several months. Um, in the hypomanic episode, he's very social, engaging, impulsive, and fun, um, and he's a lot of fun to be around. <laughs> and so, you know, um, his a lot of he, it's it doesn't become as problematic. And Bill loves that feeling. He doesn't want to let that feeling go, um, which is also very common in uh, bipolar disorder. Um, but after. Uh, after stopping, um, since he had stopped his medication, it, it developed into a full-blown mania, um, uh, during which he increased his spending, uh, purchased several expensive cars, and maxed out several credit cards. Uh, he took on really risky business ventures and ultimately had uh, remortgaged his house um, that he owned with his wife. Uh, he became disinhibited and had several brief extramarital affairs. And by the time he was hospitalized and his wife discovered the extent of his spending and indiscretions, there was a lot of reparation work to do with this couple. So um, all of these issues uh, obviously resulted in major stress. Um, the couple had to move, uh, declare bankruptcy, in addition to dealing with the betrayal of several sexual indiscretions. Um, the situation resulted in extreme distress, uh, shame and embarrassment for both members. They had to rebuild their lives. They'd lost a lot of their um, assets. Uh, you know, even things like having to go and get tested for STDs. Um, uh, in situations like this, the spouse is often stuck with very mixed feelings. <laughs> often there's a lot of feelings of rage and disappointment and anger um, about the upheaval that's been caused. But it's also mixed with, um, with uh, feelings of, of guilt, well, I can't really be angry, he was sick. And then there's that ambivalence, <laughs> you know, the, the rage versus the, the feelings of uh, guilt and empathy. Uh, it's hard to blame people when they're very sick to, uh, um, there's also some, but there, there is often blaming in, with regards to, well, he didn't take his medication, he knew he had to take his medication, he was hiding it. So anyway, these are all, all issues that come up. So uh, one of the treatments that um, is effective at times of bipolar disorder, there are several, but the one that I'm going to talk about is family-focused psychoeducational treatment, uh, which is sort of a hybrid treatment of uh, psychoeducation and family therapy. So uh, the goals of the treatment are to restore functional couple and family relationships uh, using tools like training, coping strategies, um, coaching and parenting styles, communication and problem solving skills. And uh, really, there, there's also an, an effort to understand what happened leading up to the episode and the aftermath of it as well. So um, psychoeducation is key in this situation as it's ensuring that the ill spouse is, achieving, is um, receiving adequate treatment to control their symptoms as much as possible. Um, other areas to be addressed involve resolving ongoing issues, uh, increased communication and problem solving skills. Um, interactions and feelings that maintain distress or symptoms are tracked. For example, spouses of a bipolar partner may feel very frustrated and angry at the chronicity or the duration of an episode. Uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes depressive episodes in particular can be very, very long um, and difficult to recover from. So uh, they they may feel anger and frustration, and uh, they may direct their anger either overt or, co or covert at the partner. So the therapy's ultimate focus is to work to rechannel that aggression and promote um, the re-engagement of the partners who distance themselves and promote acceptance of the partner's limitations, 
and to foster more stability and understanding in the couple unit. So. Oops, going the wrong way. So um, here I'm, uh, I'll talk very briefly about schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. So uh, psychotic disorders are severe mental disorders that cause abnormal thinking and perceptions. Two of the main symptoms are delusions, false beliefs, um, like paranoia, uh, and uh, hallucinations, which are false perceptions, hearing voices, um, uh, seeing things that aren't there. Uh, schizophrenia is, is just one type of psychotic disorder. So uh, others include delusional disorder, schizoaffective disorder. Um, so uh, treatment with couples where uh, psychotic disorder is present requires a comprehensive approach, which may include um, things like psychoeducation, information and skills to resolve conflict, evidence-based Re I'll explain all of this <laughs> rehabilitation method. Um, uh, so basically, uh, the initial goal is to stabilize the symptoms uh, through medication. Um, a common difficulty in psychotic disorders is uh, a symptom called anosognosia. Uh, 57 to 97% of people who suffer from psychotic disorders don't realize that they have a lack of insight um, and self-awareness. Uh, so, so d that first of all becomes difficult to engage people in treatment if they really don't understand what's going on. Sometimes when they are paranoid, the target of their paranoia is the partner, which is also very, very problematic and hard to engage in any kind of um, therapy. Um, and at, at that level, sometimes therapy needs to be done individually. But um, Depending on the severity of the illness and the level of insight, interventions may be rather concrete. So psychoeducation and treatment are important, as I mentioned. Uh, oftentimes there are multiple stressors that accompany the illness, including a loss or, or change of employment with resulting financial strain, uh, a change in affective functioning and cognitive functioning with more chronic untreated illness. Um, depending on the couple relationship, communication and conflict resolution skills are very important. For example, if a spouse has limited insight and remains somewhat paranoid, it will be very difficult to work on communication and conflict resolution skills. Um, at some point, with more severe illness, uh, many spouses start to question whether they want to stay in the relationship. Um, at times when symptoms are poorly controlled, especially at the beginning of an illness, um, it takes some time to, de to find out which treatment is going to work best for people. Um, uh, and if the partner is psychotic, the partner may have to leave as they, it may risk their safety or the safety of their children at times due to, I'll give you an example. Uh, so a client I worked with many years ago um, had to leave her husband. Again, had known her husband for most of her life. They grew up in the same village and they, they got married. Um, they came to Canada together. Um, <clears throat> he became ill later on in his illness. They had four children. Uh, and that, so it, and it was very, very difficult having known him all of her life. She really could not um, understand what was happening to him and, and really just kept saying, oh, it's going to get better. He's just stressed. There's something going on, but it's going to be fine. Anyway, as time went on, she realized it wasn't improving. You know, he was sleeping with a knife under his pillow. He was getting much more agitated um, because he wasn't taking treatment, not because, you know, that, that was just a reality. So sometimes... Um, you know, safety becomes an issue, and uh, and I don't use that. I don't use that example to stigmatize. I'm just saying, in the settings that I've worked in, that has often it's a very concrete issue. You know, I mean, making sure that people are safe, and um, and so eventually she had to leave. Um, sorry. Yes. Work in the couple if, if so much uh, loss of insight, right? And that's with, with 
Well, in a situation like that, no, it really had to be very separate. So it was very for, he wasn't accepting treatment and it was very, and it, whatever sort of was imposed on him, it wasn't working well. So um, he, at that point, the, he, he needed to be removed from the home and, and had to move on in his own way and the wife had to sort of rebuild. Um, but, you know, that's a very extreme example. Um, you know, people when they are treated, uh, you know, the symptoms can go away. They may struggle with some symptoms. Um, they may have a higher um, sensitivity to stress, for example. But, um, and so they may not be able to function at the level that they did before, but usually in terms of work I'm talking about. But otherwise, people can have very good and happy family lives with the treatment. But it's, the trick is just do they realize that they have the illness and will they accept to take it? And a very real, um, a very human thing also is when people do take the treatment and they start to, you know, their symptoms subside, they say, well, you know, I'm going to try going off <laughs> because, because I don't like this medication. It makes me tired. I don't want to have sex. I get, you know, I start gaining weight, um, eating all the time. And, and I think that's just, something that's just a reality so that there often is a cycle of starting medication going off. Um, but uh, with time, um, my experience has been that people generally do get much better uh, with with time, and they can uh, stabilize quite a bit. I um, was also treating a woman who, uh, really lovely, bright uh, woman, um, extremely engaging, very attractive, and she had been married in her 20s when she first got sick. And during that time, her husband, she was, it was very unstable at the beginning of her illness, and her husband, um, left. He said, I just can't. And he left. And she uh, went on. She developed insight after several hospitalizations and she's been stable for many, many years. But that, you know, that, um, that was a real injury to her, an, an emotional injury. You know, she said, I can't believe he left me. And, and she's sort of never been able to move on from that. And she's lovely. I'm always like, get out there. You should be able to meet someone, you know, you're, um, you know, cause she really is. She's, she's a really, uh, a very, very stable, looks after herself. There hasn't been any issue in about 20 years. But that, that experience um, of loss early in her marriage, the loss of her marriage, has sort of changed her entire life, which I think, you know, these are all issues that need to be looked at um, uh, when people become ill. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought here. Uh, Stop me, by the way, if you have any other questions, any time. Um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe in some ways. I think it took some time. I think it took some time, but it's sort of the years later looking back on it. I, she can understand. But she's like, I wish he had just held on, you know, she said that many times. I wish he just stayed, like it could have, you know, it could have been good and maybe it could have, you know, but I guess it's life. Um, you know, and I think there's also a difference when the illness um, occurs early and like for psychotic disorders, uh, generally people become ill in their uh, late teens, early 20s for men. Um, early to later 20s for women. And, um, and when it's an, uh, the first onset is when people are in their say 30s or 40s when their families are, you know, when they started families and they're working and, and um, have spouses, it becomes very, very difficult for, the, for the, the person themselves who's suffering and also for the spouses and the children. Um, uh, another example I can give you is of a, a couple that, um, I saw a very, very involved father uh, with two young children, very in actively involved in sports, had many friends, a high paying job, and he was the sole breadwinner in the family. Um, and after he became ill, uh, another case of the wife saying, I really don't know who this man is. I can't get him off the couch. He's lying there all day long. Um, he doesn't want to talk to anyone. We haven't seen friends in, in months. Um, and he also stopped en engaging with their children so this is a guy that was taking his kids to the park all the time, and all of a sudden he just stopped. And the kids don't understand that or why that's happening. 
So that takes a lot of work. His, he's doing better now with the right medication, but it, it is, um, it is a, a major stressor, especially, um, you know, family considerations. Her family was really pressuring um, her to leave him, uh, but they're, they're, doing, they're doing better. So psychoeducation, we've talked about um, some information and skills to resolve conflict and evidence-based rehabilitation method just means assistance finding jobs and, and structure to somebody's day. So um, he may not be able to go, go back to uh, doing the very high paying job he did before, which doesn't mean he can't work. And so that's where a lot of the type of um, work will go into, just some of the very concrete things also. So um, anxiety disorders, I'll talk briefly about this. It's a group of mental disorders characterized by significant feelings of anxiety and fear. So generalized anxiety disorder is one, social anxiety, specific phobias, uh, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll talk very briefly about obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, so, yes, sorry. Well, um, post-traumatic stress disorder can be from experiences. It, it is experience, from experiences that people have have had. Um, anxiety can run in families for sure. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, but not necessarily. A lot of it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of experiences can can cause. You know, you know, very simple experience would be if somebody who's who starts driving and they have a car accident, they may stop driving for 20 years because they got so scared, you know? Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's a disorder. I think that's just very, very natural. It's more when it, when it develops to a point where the person's functioning becomes impaired that it really becomes a disorder. So. So obsessive compulsive disorder is a disorder where orderliness, perfectionism, um, and mental and interpersonal control are paramount. So basically, people develop a certain set of rules. So for example, uh, there can be a lot of, um, uh, you know, to, to leave the house, you have to perform 30 rituals before you can actually leave the house. And if you don't perform those 30 rituals, something terrible is going to happen. And so it, it really becomes very debilitating for many people, and many people can't leave the house. <clears throat> when the rules that they have set up are broken, uh, it causes a lot of distress, um, anxiety. So the partner with OCD may derive a certain sense of control and calmness by taking charge of decision making and demanding that tasks be controlled uh, in a, performed in a certain way. Uh, in therapy with the couple, the goal will be to coach the couple in altering the rigid adherence to these standards with the goal of seeing that horrible consequences that are at the center of the anxiety and the basis of the disorder do not actually occur. It is very slow going. <laughs> yes. um, usually the treatment, uh, treatment options for anxiety disorders are individual CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but uh, is that, does anyone know what cognitive behavioral therapy is? Okay, so therapy that's used um, to explore people's cognitions and also their behaviors and to basically to, um, to treat them by analyzing them in a certain way. So uh, for people who have, um, and also behavior-wise for somebody who has a fear of flying, the way that you'll, um, you know, help them with this fear is very gradual. So you may start by bringing them to an airport, <laughs> you know, um, and then eventually into a plane just to sit and then leave. They might just start with watching, you know, a video of a, an airplane, an airplane taking off. And with each step, the, um, the physiological response will get reduced. It's kind of a simplistic explanation, but that's sort of the gist behind it. Um, and the analysis of people's thoughts, like, uh, you know, if I, uh, 
if I uh, if I go if I don't go outside without shutting the iron off, uh, without checking the iron five times, the house will burn down. Well, has has it burned down before? <laughs> you know, these are the type of thought um, analysis that uh, people will go through in cognitive behavioral therapy to look at people's assumptions and the automatic thoughts that they have, and and also to try to bring in more alternative, more healthy thoughts. So within the couple, uh, exposure will be integrated um, to the feared situation and to interventions with the couple. Exposure being like what I was talking about with the airplane. So gradually, if, you, if somebody is fearful of leaving the house without doing the 15 different steps for leaving the house, uh, they may have to just scale back to removing one of those steps and seeing what happens. You know, and seeing, and, and if the terrible event doesn't happen, then they might take um, an additional one of those steps away later. And it's very simplistic what I'm saying, but that's basically the gist of it. Um, and as uh, the individual's progress is maintained, um, you know, you take advantage of uh, new opportunities for relating. So, people who don't go out because they worry about um, that they'll that they'll be they may look you have many different people that won't go out and socialize for a number of reasons they worry about the way they are perceived uh, that's fear of rejection and it's when it becomes into a an extreme that uh, that it be, that it's uh, a disorder. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, it's connected to an impulsive? It can be, yeah, so for sure. Or um, that would be, paranoia would be more in the psychotic um, yeah. disorders. But yeah, that's a very good example, like agoraphobia, people who are scared to go out. Or, and sometimes it's just because of the, the worry about the judgment if they do go out. So again, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a therapy used to challenge um, unhelpful cognitive distortions, uh, thoughts, and maladaptive behaviors. Oops, I'm going the wrong way again. Um, so uh, personality disorders are grouped into three clusters based on similar characteristics and symptoms. Um, cluster A is characterized by odd, eccentric thinking or behavior. So um, paranoid personality disorders, schizoid, or schizotypal personality disorders. Uh, cluster B is characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, or unpredictable thinking or behavior, like antisocial, borderline, histrionic, narcissistic personality disorders. Oops, <laughs> have to get used to this. Um, so the cluster C disorders are characterized by anxious, uh, fearful thinking or behavior. Uh, so avoidant personality disorder, uh, dependent or obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Uh, the treatment options, as I mentioned before, um, CBT would be one, dialectical behavioral therapy another, uh, interpersonal therapy or family focused therapy, as we discussed before. Uh, we did talk a little bit about cognitive behavioral therapy. Dialectical behavioral therapy I'll get to soon. <laughs> and interpersonal therapy is a, a brief attachment focused um, psychotherapy which centers on, on problems and symptomatic uh, recovery. It's often used in mood disorders. Um, it also improves the quality of interpersonal relationships uh, and social functioning to reduce distress. The family-focused therapy is what we talked about earlier with regards to the hybrid, yeah, between, high, between psychoeducation and family therapy, sorry. Between uh, interpersonal therapy, is that done individually or as a couple? Like, how do you sort of make that distinction? Um, yeah, well, it, you, can, you can do with both. So one, one of the... Um, these are just general therapies that are used to, oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> these are general therapies that are used, uh, there are many others, but these are sort of the, 
say some of the main ones used to treat personality disorders. Um, but with, uh, with couples, these can be integrated as well. So um, dialectical behavioral therapy, which I'll talk about soon, will be, um, uh, is one that can be used with couples. Uh, the interpersonal therapy, it, yeah, it's all about attachment, uh, attachment focus. And so, you know, with the partners, it's also helpful to connect them to hear like where they're coming from and what their fears are, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it can be helpful. Did that, did that clarify at all? So um, borderline personality disorder is uh, characterized by a long-term pattern of unstable relationships, a distorted sense of self, uh, strong emotional reactions. Um, it is uh, one of the most common personality disorders and overlaps uh, significantly with other uh, personality disorders and access one diagnoses like depression, anxiety, substance abuse. Uh, it's also frequently accompanied by um, emotions like anger and rage. Symptoms of um, borderline personality disorder are uh, marked sensitivity to minor rejection or criticism, alternating between extremes of idealization and devaluation towards other people, and varying moods and difficulty re regulating strong emotional reactions, and dangerous impulsive behavior as well as self-harm are also correlated with the disorder. Um, okay. Uh, so dialectical behavioral therapy uh, with couples in the context of borderline personality disorder has its roots in individual CBT. Uh, so um, dialectics refer to the idea that you can have two seemingly contradictory ideas that can coexist. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, one of the characteristics of this disorder are uh, is dichotomous thinking, so people will often um, uh, look at um, issues in black or white, uh, and that can become very problematic, particularly in relationships, so, um, and interpersonal relationships in general, not just uh, romantic ones. Uh, so dialectical behavioral therapy explores ideas like uh, closeness versus conflict, um, partner acceptance versus change, intimacy versus autonomy, and others. Uh, the therapy uh, explores these ideas um, uh, with regards to how both can be achieved uh, rather than holding rigidly to one idea or the other. So uh, areas of emotional dysregulation include um, emotional ability, so problems with anger, uh, interpersonal dysregulation, which is fear of abandonment, behavioral dysregulation, which is suicidal behavior, impulsive behavior, substance abuse, um, self-dysregulation, feelings of emptiness, and cognitive dysregulation, uh, which can be transient paranoia or difficulty with thinking. Um, okay, so, so um, DBT uh, treatment is organized to teach and strengthen skills. Uh, that's really the primary focus. Um, uh, to manage each of these, the areas of the, the dysregulation I mentioned before. So uh, at its core, DBT helps people build four major skills uh, through mindfulness. So that's a psychological process um, that is used to intentionally bring one's attention to experiences that are happening uh, in the moment without judgment. So often through the use of meditation and other training. So when a lot of things are happening, there's a lot of stimulation, it's really to try to bring the person to focus on something um, like if they're having a lot of emotions to focus, say, on just their breathing. So close your eyes and breathe. And just listen to the breathe, breathing. Don't think of anything else, just the breathing. And that just generally can usually calm, um, calm down the emotional reaction. Um, distress tolerance skills are used when it's impossible to change a situation. So they're used to help us cope and survive during a crisis and to help us tolerate short-term or long-term emotional or physical pain. So. They use a lot of different techniques. Uh, the, the skills for that are, um, there are many, but some would be um, the concept of radical acceptance. Like you can't change this right now, so just accept it and live with it, but don't you know, dwell. <laughs> you know? Um, uh, sometimes just um, doing exercises like muscle tightening 
tight as you can and then let it go and to try to, and that will usually distract enough to move on. So interpersonal um, effectiveness is another one of the four major skills. Um, it's uh, to attend to relationships, attend to priorities um, versus demands in a relationship, balance what, what each person wants, balance what you want or what you should be doing, um, and to basically uh, focus on building and maintaining positive relationships. Uh, emotional regulation skills involve understanding the function of emotions, so the action um, and the urge that accompanies each emotion and whether to oppose or respond to the urge. So um, when people become highly distressed, they may cut themselves or, or self-mutilate with this particular disorder. Um, so it's to be able to, to control some of the emotions using some of the skills we've talked about um, and to, to eventually reduce some of the, the self-harming behavior. Ultimately, it's about uh, having the skills to control your, your behavior, your, your emotions, and your thoughts. Uh, within the couple, yeah, so balancing uh, acceptance and change strategies at the center uh, of the treatment. So within the couple, the therapy targets key, positive, uh, key rep repetitive problem behaviors or the lack of skills and refers back to the type of skills that can be done as a couple. Um, one of the... One of the things uh, that I find, particularly with this disorder, is highly stigmatized. And the people who suffer from it are, very, are suffering quite profoundly. Um, and so a lot of the time, people who have this disorder will be told, you know, you need to get help, <laughs> you know, go, go to therapy, go to therapy. And the nice thing when it's couple therapy, they're learning these skills together. And it's not the pe person isn't as isolated and feeling as alone. And they're more likely to, to be motivated to attend if they feel that they're not doing it alone and that they're not the targeted person here. Um, so, uh, so treatment goals uh, are organized into a hierarchy with the more severe and out of control behaviors targeted first and then uh, focusing on other behaviors and skills like communication. Due to emotional sensitivity and reactivity, clients can have extreme reactions, outbursts, um, and to what could be considered really relatively minor transgressions in a relationship. So it's learning to, to control these um, and to avoid that the transactions sort of deteriorate. So if, if one person you know, acts out, then the other person reciprocates, that can deteriorate very, very quickly and uh, become very conflictual and distressing for both people involved. Um, sometimes chronic suicidal behavior that is not unusual in this um, disorder uh, can be accidentally reinforced by soothing or nurturing at the wrong time. So for example, when people are in a lot of conflict and then one of the partners makes a suicide attempt, if the other partner responds by suddenly softening a lot, um, uh, the conflict gets resolved and that can become a pattern in a way. Again, for most couples, people are trying to connect, right? They want to connect with each other. And so people not even consciously, they will use whatever means they can. And so if it's, if this is gonna get me closer, maybe this is what I need to do. Again, it's not a conscious, it's not manipulative, it's just a, a, an effort to become, um, to connect with someone. So uh, again, the goal would be to find skills to soothe without reinforcing negative behaviors. Um, so the overarching goal of all applications of uh, DBT is to help clients create and maintain a life worth living according to their own core values and in which couple and family relationships support individual well-being um, but are also satisfying relationships in themselves. <laughs> okay. So um, mental illness uh, in a parent can certainly impact children. Uh, you know, this can vary depending on symptoms, depending on the illness, and also depending on who's in the family um, with the children. So all children need uh, support, respect, acceptance, validation, unconditional love and affection, consistency, and security. Um, at times, various symptoms of different mental illnesses can make it very difficult to respond to the needs of, of children. For example, a parent with uh, schizophrenia who's very disorganized or a parent with severe depression may not be able to wake up on time to get their child on the school bus. 
Uh, they may not be able to adhere, adhere to regular meal times. Some parents who are struggling with their own mental health issues may find it impossible to nurture or support or provide consistent um, consistency or affection for their children uh, because they themselves are suffering so much. <coughs> Sorry. Um, in such instances, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> the parent um, who does not have the illness must step, step in as much as possible to overcompensate for what's missing. Of course, for the non-ill partner, this can add an additional burden um, to an already very stressful situation. When possible, other family members um, should be enlisted to help as much as possible as well. Uh, at times, the non-ill parent will need to determine their priorities. Uh, of uh, maintaining the relationship versus protecting the child um, with regards to the behavior, as I mentioned earlier, with the mom with the knife, where the husband had the knife under the pillow, uh, and also with regards to the impact of the illness on the child. You know, are there self-harming behaviors? Uh, is there aggression, suicidal attempts? Uh, those are all very harmful to children, so at times, you know, there needs to be a rupture in the relationship to protect the child. <coughs> In general, um, children tend to feel very responsible for things that happen in their families. Uh, they can easily de develop toxic uh, sense of guilt or responsibility uh, that can follow them well into adulthood. Many children become uh, parentified in the face of a parent who has a mental illness. They may feel the need to take care of their parent. Um, they may feel, and often do, feel very responsible for their parent's happiness. And they may be enlisted to look after their siblings um, and are given a lot of extra responsibilities. Um, for example, when a parent is depressed, it's really not uncommon for children to act out because um, <clears throat> if we go back to attachment theory, the parent's emotional withdrawal will trigger an, an, an attempt to get closer for the child. So the child may act out negatively because uh, negative attention is better than no attention at all. So once again, the, uh, the non-ill parent or another responsible, consistent family member uh, needs to compensate for what is missing and to repair and protect as much as possible. Um, some skills that can be taught to children include teaching self-care and limit setting. So children need to understand that everyone is responsible for their own actions um, and that they are not to blame for what is happening in their families. Uh, it, it, that even though a parent is sick, it isn't their fault. Uh, they need to understand that they're still allowed to have fun even when other people are sad or sick or upset. Um, <clears throat> and again, the behavior needs to be depersonalized. So it's not your fault. This is what's happening in our family, <coughs> but you still need to live your life and be a kid. How can you say for a spouse to separate You're absolutely right, and that's where we're going next. Oh no, <laughs> did that again. <laughs> I keep going to the wrong way with that, I don't know, this thing. Okay. Okay. So how you can help your loved ones. Um, so uh, um, for, for the spouses, uh, show support and empathy. Um, you know, separate the, the illness from the loved one. Uh, your loved one is not the disease. I think sometimes people want to help and they become, um, they become very, very involved and try to try to get in, you know, overly involved in the treatment, which is helpful sometimes, and sometimes it's too much, because then they kind of lose sight of, um, of uh, the couple and their partner as an equal, rather than somebody that they need to be taking care of all the time. Uh, seek support and empathy for yourself. Uh, come to groups and sessions at Friends for Mental Health. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it really is very, very important. Um, uh, don't become uh, his or her therapist. It can be very difficult, as I mentioned before, um, especially because a lot of the time mental illness seems to permeate every aspect of couple and family life at certain periods of time, especially in acute phases of illness. Um, so the, the non-ill spouse tends to feel a tremendous um, burden to maintain the family and the stability of the family and of the spouse sometimes. So. 
So while it may seem that way for a while, especially at the beginning of an illness, um, you know, it's, it's very important to, to also realize it's a period of time and things do get better. Tomorrow's another day. Things are very likely to stabilize and improve, but it, it does take time. Uh, seek individual and couple counseling as needed. Everybody needs to take care of themselves, see friends, um, practice self-care, uh, take a break, get out of the house when you can. Um, practice relationship care, so maintain um, positive communication, admire each other, check in with each other, avoid blaming. Um, this can be especially true with regards to spouses who have an ill child, sort of a different thing that we're talking about. Uh, it becomes easy to blame each other. Um, you know, you were always so cold and harsh with him. You were too strict. Our child is sick because of your genes. Um, none of these are helpful. Really, a team approach is what works best and to, and to, uh, to stay together and to, to sort of nurture the, the attachment between each other, not pull it apart. So that's about it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. I don't know if you have any questions at all. I'm here.